Is your praise to God real? Or is it phony and fake? Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking what God wants from us. Sometimes we just decide on our own what we're willing to give him. Many times what we do is just flat out done out of habit with no uh, filled with no feelings. Today, in no uncertain terms, you will see that God does not want your phoniness. God will tell us today through his prophet Isaiah that we should be living right over empty rituals. Sunday School with the Deek. I'm Deacon Wallace Hill IV, proud member of the Mount Pisgah Missionary Baptist Church, where my father, Wallace Hill III, is the pastor. Now, I tell you every week that it's an honor for me to have you take the time out of your busy schedule uh, for me to teach you the Sunday School lessons based on the International Lesson Series. Now, for those of you that are new, do me a favor and listen. Don't just let this go by. Do me a favor, because some of you have been watching so long, you, you just let it pass by. But go down to the bottom of the page and hit the subscribe button. And then click that little bell right next to it. And each week, you'll be notified. Ding, ding, ding. The Deke has uploaded another lesson. Now, the goal of Sunday School with the Deke is to bring the Word of God to life uh, in your life. And to give you an understanding of the scriptures and make the word of God real and interesting and an integral part of your day-to-day -day being. Ultimately, I would hope that these lessons will inspire those who don't have a relationship with Christ to come ask him, what must I do to be saved? So today we're in the book of Isaiah for the third straight week. Uh, Isaiah is a very tricky book, but still regarded as one of the most interesting and wonderful books of the Bible. Now Isaiah is full of prophecy, uh, full of things from the past, things of the future, um, and many of the things Isaiah talks about have not even come to pass yet. Um, the good thing about the lesson this week is you don't really need to understand the trickiness of the book of Isaiah to be able to understand this lesson. All you need to know for this week's lesson is that God is speaking through his prophet Isaiah uh, to his chosen children of Israel. Now, he's warning them through his prophet uh, that they better get their act together um, because he doesn't take too lightly to fake worship or fake fellowship. Um, and it's my hope uh, that this lesson will inspire us to do better uh, and God's children, you know, as God's children to worship and praise and obey with sincerity. God knows the difference, y'all. And, and you'll see today that he doesn't enjoy being used. Uh, so let's get into the lesson. Um, a little background for today's lesson. You know, in this chapter, God calls on Isaiah to uh, address the problems of what I like to call false religious observance. When we go over these verses, you're going to see that the problems appear to deal with um, two religious uh, observances in particular. Uh, one was fasting, which is really will be the main part of our lesson. But if you continue to read the, the chapter, the other one, um, which is not in our lesson, is about the way they observe the Sabbath, Sabbath today. Now, you're going to see that, um, that these are only the effects of the problem rather than the root of the problem. The root of the, the problem is uh, people who observe spiritual 
disciplines for selfish reasons. And this is going to hit home to all of us today. Mostly trying to, trying to, uh, to get something for themselves. You know, trying to gain God's blessings. Uh, acting all religious uh, while ignoring things, you know, in front of their face like hunger and poverty and homelessness and people in need. You know, the root solution uh, is true devotion. True devotion to God, which should grow naturally out of love for God, right? Um, people who love God will worship Him to honor Him rather than trying to manipulate Him. And, and I hate to bust your bubble, y'all, but God can't be manipulated, <laughs> you know? You know, I've known some people in my lifetime who, who like, for instance, give to the church financially in hopes that God will give it back to them tenfold. Now, the Bible does tell us, Jesus did say, in the, uh, I think it was in the book of Luke, that, you know, give, and it should be given uh, unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that uh, you, you give, it shall be measured back to you. Now, you know, you read that verse and you say, oh, if I give a hundred, then God is going to give me a hundred times a hundred. Right. He says, give and I'll give to you. So <laughs> God can't be manipulated. It's supposed to be done out of the goodness of your heart and your love for God. So, you know. If you give financially to the church with the wrong attitude, um, uh, or, you know, that's another way of trying to manipulate God through your worship. Now, Isaiah is going to openly, boldly, sharply, you know, get on their case today for their sins and particularly their, their hypocrisy, right? And, and their formality and how they worship. You know, it's just formal rituals. No feeling in it at all. Um, and the funny part about all of this is that they were, the people were angry and complained that God didn't love, you know, didn't notice their, that, uh, or pay attention to the way they worshiped. They didn't pay attention to their religious rituals. You know, particularly in their fasting. Um, but the problem is they were not fasting in the right way manner or the right mindset you know when you fast it's meant to be a connection between you and God you know Jesus says sometimes you know some things can only be accomplished through fasting and prayer right but the, the key is not to look like you lost your best friend when you fasted you know to the point where people go what's wrong with you girl oh, I'm good girl I'm just fasting you know <laughs> you know I ain't ate since six o'clock this morning you know you you know, no one should ever know that you're fasting. You know, it's between you and God. These people were fasting with the wrong attitude. Uh, they were fasting, but as far as the other aspects of their lives, it was full of cruelty and, and strife and wickedness. And they were only concerned with external expressions, right? Or external appearances, how, how they looked while they were worshiping, you know? So let's go ahead and get into today's lesson. But before I do, I have to say this. Our lesson date is January 22nd, 2023. Our lesson text is Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 through 10. Our lesson title is Living Right Over Empty Rituals. Grab your Bibles, grab your books, grab your pen, grab your paper. And let's get into today's lesson. Verse 6. Oh, nope, nope, not gonna start there. Our lesson begins with verse 6, but I wanna use, I wanna start with verse 1. And I'll read verses 1 through 5 from the New Living Translation. Uh, then we'll start our lesson. I think reading this is gonna help us a lot. So hold on to your seat, y'all. The good thing about uh, doing these lessons over YouTube is that if I touch a sore spot in your life, <laughs> y'all can say, ouch. But your boy won't even know it. So, uh, verse 1. You know, now this is God telling Isaiah what to tell the people. All right, here we go. 
Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Verse 2. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. He said, seem delighted. They act like a religious nation would never abandon the laws of God. They asked me to take action in their, uh, on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed, God? We have been very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why, I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. Verse 4. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? The kind of fast, that kind of, this kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by ignoring, excuse me, you humble yourselves by going through the motions. Of, of penance, uh, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you're calling fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? Now, this is where our lesson begins, but you can see from the first five verses that God not playing here. He's like, I ain't. Why do you expect me to accept what you've given me when you, you live your whole life this way? Why do you expect me to give you something when you're pretending in my, in my temple? You're pretending to want to be close to me. And I, and I think a lot of us fail in this area. We pretend like we love God. We pretend like we want to uh, be near him. But then when it comes to doing the things that he wants us to do, we don't want to do them. So... Um, I really think we needed to hear those first five verses so we can fully understand how angry God is at his people. So remember part of why we're, um, remember part of why we are created as people is to worship God. So when that worship comes across as self-serving, then God is not going to take lightly to that. So let's get, go to verse six. Verse six, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. So God says, I don't want the kind of fasting that you're doing. Instead of you coming to me with, uh, with that fake fasting stuff, I would prefer that you, come, you go free those people who have been wrongly in prison. You know, lighten the burden of, of others. Free the oppressed. You know, remove the chains that bind people. Make it easy on people. Help people. When you see a need, take care of them. That's what I would rather you do over this spiritual rituals that you're trying to give me here. You know, your rituals uh, that have no feeling. You know, you know, and only give glory to yourself and not to God. The problem today, y'all, with all this, you know, in our society. Um, our society is breaking down as a whole and now it's starting to infiltrate the church you know church used to be you know it used to mean something you know church was a safe haven you know a place to lay your burdens down a place to forget what was going on outside in the outside world and to allow you to praise God freely you know no matter what you might be going through but you know everyone is so selfish now that I don't even know if many of us know how to get outside ourselves and worship and get God and get in the spirit and worship in spirit and truth. Our minds are everywhere uh, other than on God when we're at church. You know, there's no way you could praise God while constantly checking your phone. No way. You could be mad at me and say, yes, I can or whatever, but no way. You know, and, and, and I, or, or sitting next to your friend and talking the whole time, right? And I'm not 
standing on my soapbox. I'm 100% guilty. <laughs> so this was me saying, ouch, the whole time I was studying this. You know, my mom said to me a couple of weeks ago when we was at church, she said, you stay on your phone in church, don't you? And I'm, <laughs> you know, and I'm, you know, and the, and I, I guess the problem with that is she told me that while we was in church, <laughs> which means she was fixated on me and not on, on, on God. <laughs> no, I'm just playing my, uh, but there is something, you know, that I just thought about my, di my distraction to, to my phone, um, could have also been distraction to her because she, she, you know, it interrupts her, you know, because I'm in her purview. Um, you know, so, but God wants all of us. And when I say that, I mean 100% of us. Uh, he don't want part of you while you're there. You know, if your mind is on everything other than him at church, then we, we're just, just as bad as these people in this, in this scriptures. Uh, just going through the motions. You know, I got to do better. I, I'll be the first one to say, I have to do better. It's sometimes when I'm locked in, but it's a lot of times when I'm not, you know, my mind goes everywhere. And you can't give God uh, all of you when you're that way. You might as well just stay home. God says, I would rather you do something nice for someone rather than to come to me with your fake self-serving worship. You know, how can you act religious in front of everybody and have such a mean spirit or malice in your heart? God says... Uh, you can keep that. I don't want it. You know, it's funny how we could put on a church face, right? You know the church face. <laughs> uh, listen, I, I don't think there's a better transformation place on earth than the church parking lot. Uh, what do you mean, Deke? We can uh, be on our way to church arguing with our spouse or, or fussing with our kids uh, or telling someone off on the phone. But as soon as you hit that church parking lot, you transform, <laughs> you transform and got your little church face on, you know. Uh, but as soon as you hit the church parking lot, you know, going home, we transition right back to where we were before we walked in. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So we give God two hours of fakeness and six days and 22 hours of realness. That's going to set in with somebody. He says, if you want to fast the, the way it pleases me, begin with getting right with your brothers and sisters. Stop oppressing others. Reach out and help others. Stop acting wickedly towards others. This means that, you know, getting right with God begins by stopping the uh, evil that we do towards others. Start loving others. This means that getting right with God continues by doing um, loving things for other people. That's how you please me. That's what God is saying here in this verse. Let's go to verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor uh, that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thy own flesh. <laughs> In other words, he's saying, share your food with hungry people. You know, give shelter to homeless people that you know may need a place to stay. You know, give clothes to you, people who you see need them, and do don't hide from relatives and 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 you know people that you know need your help. You know, he so he continues here in verse seven with. Um, saying he would prefer to you what he would prefer for you to do than to come giving me that fake self-serving worship. You know, you might get mad with me today because you may not like, you know, my choice of words when I say self-serving. But if you, you know, if you all about you during worship, then that's what it is. If you don't worship God because you're mad at somebody, that's self-serving. If you don't worship God because y'all just ain't feeling it today, that's self-serving. You know, if you don't want to sing or pray or read a scripture uh, because ain't nobody at church, that's self-serving. You know, if you can only go to church on a certain Sunday because a certain choir sing that week, that's self-serving. Verse 7 says, share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. 
Give clothes to those who need them. And, and, and don't hide from relatives that need your help. That's not godly. So, you know, to know of a need and then turn away, turn away from it. But you all on Facebook and every other word in your post is God this and God that. You know, you can't have it both ways. You can't straddle the fence. You know, if you're a child of God, you have to do God stuff. You can't walk around mad and pissed and have an evil spirit all the time. And you better worship him. Um, and, and you better worship him in the right spirit. Right? My wife would tell you, it used to bother me so bad when I used to uh, teach Sunday school in person. And no one would show up. Uh, I would put 10 hours of um, studying in and five people show up. And I'm like, dang, I can't even get uh, one person per hour that I studied, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then it even bothered me more when, when now that I'm doing Sunday school virtually and YouTube would tell me how many people watched the lesson, you know. It was eating me up inside, y'all. It was even, um, I was even waiting to see when my family members would watch the Sunday school lesson. I would say to myself, uh, dang, my wife, my mom, my aunt, you know, my brother, they don't even watch it for four or five days after I do it. You know, how am I supposed to expect others to get excited about what I do? You know, it was eating me inside, but thank God I finally saw the light. <laughs> I've been set free from that burden and it feels so good. Because I had to, uh, but, but when I was, when it was bothering me, guess what that was doing? That was me being self-serving. It was all about me, right? You know, that was me wanting to be elevated by how many people came to Sunday school, how many people watched my video. You know, I wasn't trying to worship God. I was worshiping me. I was letting my self-worth be de de determined uh, by how many people watched or how many people came to hear me. Let's go to verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be renewed. So first God made it clear in verses 3 through 5 uh, that the people, people's fasting was flawed, and, and, and therefore it was unsatisfactory to him. Then God made it clear in verse 6 and 7 what he needed. You know, now God outlines what people can expect if they do the things that he tells them to do in verse 6 and 7. He says, fix injustice, free the oppressed, feed the hungry. He says, if you would couple that with your fasting, uh, you know, living a life of righteousness with your fasting, then I will answer your prayers. If you would couple your fasting with living a life of righteousness uh, and love, then you will have lives full of light. Uh, full of healing, full of righteousness, full of the glory of God. Uh, he says, your light shall break forth as the morning. God is promising you blessings here. N you know, not only will they have light, he says, but even in their darkness, it will be like you're in light. Right? He says, you know, and secondly, he says, then you can expect healing, quick healing. So he says, if you fast in the right manner and then you treat people right, I got you. Let's go to verse 9. Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am. If thou take away from the midst uh, of thee that yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. You know, look at, look at what God says. He, he said he will do for you. Uh, if you do right by him. He says, when you call out to me, then I'll answer. He says in, in, in this verse, when you, uh, when you call, I will answer. When you cry out to him, he says, he'll say, here I am. Isn't that a wonderful feeling? I was reading this getting goosebumps. If you, he says, when, you, when, you, when, you, when, when you're praising him and then you live right toward people and then you call on my name and you look for me, he'll say, here I am. Wallace, here I am. What do you need? Here I am. Man, 
Can you imagine God saying to you, here I am? You know, like I said, that gives me chills. So the next part of, of verse 9 uh, is, is our first if statement. You know, we'll get another if statement in verse 10. But uh, the second part of verse 9 and the first part of verse 10, you know, outline what God wants, wants us to do, right? And then verse, the, the second part of verse 10 and verse 11, which 11 is not in our lesson, um, provides uh, the then statement telling them what we can expect from him if we do the things that he tells us to do. So first God calls, you know, the people to fix their, the, uh, fix, you know, three facets of their, uh, of, uh, of unjust behavior, right? The first thing to do is go remove the yoke of, of bondage from those who are not set free and you know this is old best testament speak but think of it in terms of if you see people who who have some issues or some problems or or are, are tied up in in maybe some wrong things try to help them free them right uh um he said then then he says, stop pointing the finger. It, actually, the words, the verse says, putting forth the finger. Uh, stop finger pointing. You know, it could be, you know, a gesture of contempt, you know, or a way of casting blame on other people. He says, stop, stop doing that. You know, and then the third thing he says is stop speaking evil of others. And then he continues in verse 10. And if thou draw out thy soul in the hunger, and satisfy the afflicted soul. Then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the nor uh, noonday. He, so that's this is the second part of the verse. That says he says if you do this, then I'll do this. So God expects these people to feed the hungry and to satisfy the needs of the afflicted. He wants us to do that. If there is a need, you love your brother as yourself. He says, if you draw out your hearts, that means when you see something going on, it, it should hurt you. It should tug at your heartstrings, right? It, it, the, the, verse 10 says, and if thou draw out thy soul in the hungry. When you see somebody that's hungry, it should touch your soul. It should make you, as, as a child of God, want to go do something for somebody. Give something to somebody. You know, buy them a meal. It, you know. You're not only supposed to feed the hungry, but you're also supposed to give them your heart. That's what he's saying. They should feel for these people who are less fortunate for themselves. Passionless giving at a distance is not enough. That's like, oh, here, I'll put $25 toward the food bank. That's, you know, it's good, but if you don't feel nothing for it, if you ain't feel like it doesn't touch your heart and, and make you want to do it, if you do it out of you know, passionless, you know, that's not enough. So you should feel when you do. And, and, and then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. This is the beginning, like I told you, of the then statement. He says, if you do this, then I'll do this. If the people do what God outlined uh, in the first two if statements, then they should expect light, that light will push through darkness. That means when you're going through tough times, light is coming. Light is a, a metaphor for positive things like blessings and the word of God they call it light, right? Darkness is a metaphor for negative things, you know, such as wickedness and imprisonment and death. He says, if you do these things I tell you to do, then your life will be full of light. So God promises those who, who are righteous that light will drive out the darkness in their lives. You know, and it'll be like noonday all the time. I have a friend that went to Alaska recently. You know, sometimes Alaska will have 22 hours of daylight. <laughs> I mean, it, but conversely, sometimes they'll have 22 hours of nighttime. But think of that in terms of, of, of how God says your life will be if you treat people right. It'll always be daylight. You know, that's good news, y'all. You know, he gives a, us a formula right here. He says, if you want to be a child of God, then act like it. God doesn't want lip service. He wants hearts. And how can you worship and 
uh, God and treat people so bad. First John chapter four, verse 20 says, if a man says, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So think about that. You know, we always talk about how we love God, but we don't love our brothers and sisters. And it doesn't matter that they may have wronged you or did something to you. God loved everybody. So make sure your worship is for real. Don't, you can't worship God and then have live a godless life. God didn't want their fasting because they were cruel people and they were just doing things out of rituals, just doing it because it was on the program with no feeling. And if you're wandering in church and just sitting down and just watching and going home, you might as well have stayed home. <sighs> All right, so next week's lesson will be coming from the book of Joel. Chapter 2, verses 21 through 27. The title of the lesson is Promises of Restoration and Gladness. And like I say every week, hit the subscribe button, comment, and thank you for those who comment. And I appreciate it. I think it was like three people last week, three people the other week. Thank you. It does so much for my soul, y'all. Um, your comments help me, and your sharing the lesson will help others by planting a seed. So let's dismiss. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Sunday school with.